Okay, I'm sort of revisiting this um, section between Paul and Peter because Peter seems to be taking a very different approach than he was in previous verses prior to verse 12. Um, basically, in Peter, what he's doing <coughs> is you match up the syllables on track one, which is the left-hand side here. You match Basically, in Peter, what he wants you to do is match up the syllables in his track one, which, because those are AD years, and Paul's numbers, Paul's syllables are only AD years. So he wants you to match up what he's saying to the same AD years, left-hand side here, in Peter. And that works like a sort of interleaved line by line, tracking to what Paul says to elucidate the temple 490 is distinct from Paul's own historical 490 and the rise of apostate church. Because what Peter's trying to do is reassure you that yes, the temple of believers will still be completed. Okay. In other words, there's still going to be, as it were, enough believers on the planet throughout the church age that there will be, as it were, a temple standing of believers so the time can continue. Because that was the criterion in Daniel 9. So that doctrine is still true. It's just that what is defined as a temple changes to a body of believers that was in Ephesians 2. And then, of course, that's the theme of Peter's letter, living stones, priesthood, that sort of thing. Okay, but once you get to syllable 350, which is where Paul is saying church tanks because of the, the you know, church going political under Constantine. Okay, once it tanks here, Peter changes his style of interweaving his text with Paul. And I'm trying to figure out what to call it. And the closest thing I can think of to call it is a postscript. So, but it's like, okay, where do you insert his postscript? Because he goes beyond Paul's meter. Paul's meter ends at 434. And that's a play on Daniel's 62nd week at the end of Daniel 926. Peter's doing the same thing. But like Daniel finally did at the end of Daniel 9, Daniel 924 in particular, I mean, 923 in particular. Um, Peter is going beyond the, four, the 434. Okay, so like, in what way are we to read the Petrine text? Is interweaving with the Pauline text. And he's obviously talking the same topic. Okay, because here, Paul is saying, official announcement of your salvation. That's already implicit beginning right hip up here, okay, which is the Pauline text, the Petrine text. We'll be talking in an interleaved manner to it right here. Okay, but the whole of what Peter's saying, let me open this up for you. The whole of what Peter's saying after starting with verse 10 is all one unit about the prophets of old, knowing that they were writing to church, which is very amazing, okay, because Paul calls church the mystery doctrine, all right, so wh what did the old prophets know about us? They knew there was going to be somebody, at least, whether it would be called church or not, okay, and you can sort of see hints of that in Daniel, Daniel 9, 10, 11, and 12. But Peter's whole topic here is about what the prophets, okay, then knew about us, okay? And he closes with, these are things about us that even angels crane their necks to look at. They, they earnestly desire to stoop over to look at, down at us. They're real interested in us, is the point here, in this final text which ends at 483, which closes out the 69 weeks in Daniel um, 926. So we're in a time bubble right now. That's what Peter's playing to, and Paul had done that also. Okay, so how am I going to sit here and interleave the text from verses 10 through 12 when it's talking about what the old prophets knew about us? 
because that's kind of like a, that whole thing is a postscript. It's all one unit. What you're seeing on screen right now is one unit of text. It's one concept about what they knew about us and why they were writing what they were writing for our benefit. Okay? And we know that they were doing that, because, you know, from other stuff in Paul. But how do I interleave this text in Peter, okay, to what Paul was saying? How do I how do I interleave this? Okay, it's now in the wrong order. Here's the Pauline text now. All right. Paul's also talking in one unit here. The whole text, the whole concept, everything Paul's saying, verses 13 and 14 are one unit. All right. It's really important that you follow the flow of what he's saying. In whom you also hear in the divine word of truth, the official announcement of your salvation. That's point one. Bullet point two, in whom even believing you were sealed by the Holy Spirit, the heritage pledge by the Holy One. Heritage pledge is, is the way I'm translating what he's saying here. Epangelias, it literally means promise. But it's a, it's a heritage pledge of salvation of inheritance, okay, by that Holy One. Okay, this one is the Holy Spirit. He's in you now. He's the down payment as a pledge of your future. Okay, in other words, you, one of the reasons you can't lose your salvation, one of like 40 reasons, is because the Holy Spirit's indwelling you now. He is the down payment on your future inheritance, which you cannot lose. Okay, there are portions of your inheritance you can reject, but you can't lose them. In other words, the only way you won't get them is if you refuse the will that's set up for you in eternity past. Okay. He's down payment on the inheritance. In other words, it's yours, it's reserved, it's kept for you. And that's what Peter said at the beginning of 1 Peter 1. But you can say, look, I don't want this. You can't lose your salvation whether you want it or not. But you can lose some of the additional provisions and bequests in the inheritance of the will of God by not you know fulfilling the conditions the conditions are you have to learn how to use your assets down here all right and that's covered elsewhere in Ephesians okay so this is all one unit in Paul even though you also heard you believed you're sealed sealed means that you're owned by God you can't not own your you can't not be owned it would be up to God to say you're no longer owned by him he ain't gonna change his mind Okay, that was in the video I did showing from to Timothy about how he cannot deny himself. Forget it. You can't you can't cause the seal. You can't break the seal. Only the owner has the right legally to break the seal. All right? So, the down payment is the Holy Spirit himself on this inheritance of ours into resulting in the redemption of the possession. We are the possession of Christ resulting in praise for his glory. This is all one set of text in Paul. Let me do the Paul thing and I'll get it back up to you. All right? This is all one set of text. Look. See, it's all one unit. Look at the English. It's it's all one sentence. You can't break up the sentence. It's all one sentence of legal as it were provisions. In legal documents, when you have one sentence, and everything has got a different provision inside that sentence. That sentence is a whole and it cannot be broken. I mean, you have to write a new contract to break it. Well, there is no new contract. All right. So how is Peter going to interleave his text in here? And my guess is that we aren't supposed to read it that way. My guess is that what we do with Peter versus this text in Paul Okay, let's do it at uh, 100. One, two. Okay, that this text in Paul, let's see if I can get it all on screen. Well, I still can't. All right. Ah, so hard to record and do this. That this text in Peter, which is talking about the old time prophets, all right that it's like to be read like separately the whole unit 
So is it read before or is it read after what Paul is saying here? Or is it somehow interspersed in a different way? And I don't know. If I were to take a guess, I would say, okay, you got Paul explaining that his generation is first fruits, therefore every succeeding generation will have its first fruits, which are little handfuls of crop. Handfuls, small numbers of believers actually maturing in Christ. Small, very small. First fruits was a couple of handfuls of grain that Aaron in the temple waved before the mercy seat. I mean, you know, he was in front of the veil. He waved it before the mercy seat so that 50 days from that day you could harvest your crops. This is about harvesting the Gentiles period. That was what Pentecost signified in the law. And so now the tables are kind of reversed. Yes, the Gentiles are being harvested. And by the way, anybody who's a Jew who believes in Messiah will also be harvested as church. That's the point that Paul's making right there in black and gold. All right. So now he's talking to the, the subsequent generations. And he's basically saying, hi, there's only going to be a few of you in each generation who mature. This is what you're to remember as part of your, you know, maturation process. You were sealed by the Spirit. See, you cannot mature in Christ if you don't know you're, you're eternally saved. It's a it's roadblock. If you think you have to keep earning your salvation over and over again, you stay a baby. And that's what Hebrews 5.11 through 6.12 addresses. Hebrews was written to baby Christians who weren't learning what they were supposed to be learning. That's part of the audience. So Hebrews 5.11 through 6.12 is talking back to this. They're not treating their salvation as secure. They're trying to crucify Christ afresh by doing all their works. And so that's why Hebrews 6, 1 through 6, 6 is talking about, let's not go back to the elemental things like changing your mind about dead works. All right? So you can't mature unless you know that you're eternally saved. The assurance is vital to going on in the spiritual life. So that's why Paul mentions it here. And this one is down payment on the inheritance of ours. That's another way of saying the same thing into redemption you're already redeemed he talked about that in verse 6 resulting in praise for his glory this is the outcome temple you know the history will complete but it's always you know 69th week in Daniel so it's a round robin so these two verses are going to play over and over and over and over until church matures with very few people in every generation maturing that's what Paul's saying so now Peter looks I, if I were to just guess I would say that this resulting in praise for his glory is where Peter means to append a footnote okay to explain why what Paul says is true okay and the main reason why what Paul says is true is because the prophets of old wrote what they wrote, meaning Bible in your hand, that you get, that you need to mature. They wrote what they wrote with us in mind. Because that's what verses 10 through 12 cover. You can read it in translation if the Greek is not familiar to you. Okay, That's why they wrote what they wrote. They were looking into the timing of Christ's birth. They were looking into you know, the grace that was preached to us. They knew about it. See, this is the grace that was preached to us. So Paul is playing back to this section of, I and mean, Peter is playing back to this section of Paul when he writes this. But he's putting it at the end, which is, it's like reverse Greek. This is what's confusing. Okay, he's putting it at the end of the sentence instead of at the beginning, which you would expect. All right, and he's putting at the beginning of the sentence concerning this salvation, which makes it sound like he's playing on the end of Paul here. But you can't divorce this text. You can't stick in other words to interleave in this text of Paul. It's all one unit. He's, he's getting to a climactic point. Okay, you heard, okay, you heard, you believed, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit himself as a heritage pledge. The Holy Spirit is down payment on your inheritance. Okay, that's why you know you can't lose it. 
into redemption. See, all these clauses are, are knitted together di directly and exactly. You can't insert anything. So where do we stick in the Peter text? The only thing I can think of is that either you stick it in after Paul finishes here as a postscript, this whole Petrine text, verses 10 through 12. Or, and this is kind of hard to defend, you stick it in after here. But the Petrine text is all one block, just like Paul's is all one block. It's meant to be one block. There are no more orange, there are no more exit windows being depicted by Peter here. None. The only exit is through learning scripture. So he talks about scripture. See, the, the only orange, which is divisible by seven, is right here, right there, and right here. So your only exit window is inside scripture. It's not going to be going anywhere. If you're trapped, if you're trapped in Rome, New Rome, Constantine's Rome, at this time, your only hope is to be quiet and just study scripture. That's what I'm getting out of this. Now maybe, you know, it's another message. But that's what I'm getting out of it. Because now he's just talking about the AD years. There's no exit window here. There's no overlapping of his text with Paul's. Because there's no orange at all. No orange. There are no exit windows being depicted here. All right? So your only hope is to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which is how Peter ends Second Peter. So here he's talking about scripture. Concerning the salvation, diligent inquiries and searches were made by the prophets. Concerning the grace that was preached to you. See, this should have been first in the sentence. Concerning the grace that was preached to you. See, in whom you also hearing. Well, you can't hear if you didn't have somebody teach you. The official announcement of your salvation. Peter's keying off the word salvation here. So if I were to stick verses 10 through 12 anywhere as an interspersal in the Pauline text, I think I'd have to stick it just after the end of this verse. The official announcement of your salvation. And then treat this in Paul as a new paragraph because the divine word of truth is mentioned here the official announcement of your salvation is mentioned here and that's what Peter's talking about but he's talking about it in verses 10 through 12 to go all the way down past Paul to 483 all right that's the only thing I can think of to say is how you'd insert it otherwise my guess is that you just read Paul first Go to 434 and then treat Peter as a codicil. Because these are legal documents. That's why this is so important. Paul is, made, is, is talking about a legality, about the inheritance. So in legal documents, there's a certain style you've got to follow. In the interspersal and incorporation by reference via the meter that Peter's using is a valid legal technique. But here, it looks like it's a whole codicil that you attach. And then he's telling you the reference points for the codicil, syllable 350, and then he goes past Paul to append the codicil explaining, the, the, the codicil explaining how what Paul says comes true. Because right here, when he's saying the angels even want to bend down to look, okay, they want to see God praised. Okay, the angels are going to watch this process of us being turned into praise for God's glory. They're watching it. They're anxious to find out how that happens. Because look, think about this for a minute. They're so much superior to us. And we're such putzes. How is it possible for God to turn us into praise for his own glory? This isn't magic. It is supernatural, but it's not magic. How is it that his head can get into our heads when we're so puny and small and preoccupied with the dry cleaning and Johnny's haircut and what we're going to eat for dinner? How is that going to cause praise for his glory? Who's going to want to hear him when we're so busy with our own puny affairs? If I were an angel, honey, I'd be really anxious to find out how that's going to happen. That's a mystery to me. 
Well, mystery is the key word that Paul uses. Doctrine known only to a select group. Yeah, and the select group are those maturing in him, which is what Paul's talking about in these last two verses. So, I'm sorry this is so unwieldy an explanation, but as far as a legal codicil, how we're supposed to read Peter as appending to Paul, instead of interleaving texts like before, starting at verse 10, I think what you got to do is either just read Paul's stuff separately, going all the way down to 434, and then start over, as it were, and you're reading a commentary by Peter, also in one unit, from verses 10 through 12 on the Pauline text starting at verse 13. That's one answer. The other answer is that maybe you could insert the Pauline text starting, you know, at the same benchmark where he's, you know, ending at 350, okay, which goes through Paul's 368, which means that you could maybe stop here in Paul, official announcement of your salvation, insert these three verses in Peter as a a separate paragraph elaborating on what the the Old Testament writers knew and of course the gospel writers knew. Insert all of this text after the official announcement of your salvation in Paul. So it would be you're closing the paragraph in Paul right here. Then you go back to Peter. Oh, I'm sorry the mouth sticks. And you start reading at verses 10 through verses 12 all the way to the end going past Paul and then you come back to Paul and then it becomes the climactic close that it is okay in whom you also he hearing even believing sealed your inheritance into praise for his glory that's the best I can do if you come up with a better idea let me know signing off